welcome to the Time to Explore podcast. Vlogcast is the uh, term I coined uh, or found out the other day that kind of ticks all the boxes of what we do here. Videographer and uh, photographer, podcaster, everything. So vlogcaster uh, is the new tag I'm going with. Today I'm joined with uh, Wolf Starchild of Barefoot Bushcraft. in uh, Ontario, Canada, and he's coming to us uh, via Zoom today, and we're going to ask him, Wolf, how do you adventure? Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, I know that's know, a long it, list for you, isn't it? Yeah, it's a long list. I think it's changed over the years. It's devolved. So when I got into outdoor exploration, oh, geez, you know, almost two decades ago now, yeah. um, you know, I was like many people, I made that journey of going uh, even the internet was in its infancy. So you're like, you know, you've got to buy the expensive $300 knife because the cheap one won't do the most expensive lightweight backpacker, you know, that you can lift with one finger, uh, all the tactical cool gear with all the pockets and the Molly. And you look like a soldier when you go out. And then over time it sort of devolves where you're like, I don't need this and I don't need that. And then, um, I, I, I find me personally, the more time I spend in the wilderness, the more I want to become one with nature, and that st you start uh, you start losing all those all those amenities to a certain degree, right? So you're like, well, I don't need this, and I don't need that, and how did they do it 300 years ago? Yeah, um, and you know, and uh, it all started really taking this very seriously when I hiked the Bruce Trail, and that is in Ontario, Canada. There's a trail that runs about a thousand kilometers. And it starts in a place called Queenston, Ontario, um, and it runs all the way up along the two Great Lakes, Erie and uh, Ontario, runs all the way up to Tobermory to Lake Huron. And you did that barefoot, correct? I did, yes, yes. <laughs> it's yes, the name Barefoot Bushcraft. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Believe it or not, we actually we chose that name uh, because we teach primitive skills, right? And when you look yep. around the world, that's how primitive people are. So that's what it was supposed to bring in, but it never really stuck. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, with the, uh, so what got you started into the, uh, the running your bushcraft school and just the whole adventure of that? Well, I, you know, I, I started out life like many people working at a regular job, doing regular things. And I, uh, it was the Bruce trail that did it to me. I never expected it to be what. Uh, indigenous people call a spirit quest, but it ended up turning out to be a spirit quest. Um, so, you know, you leave your family, you go on a journey, you end up um, suffering because it was a challenging journey. Yeah. And then you come out a changed person at the end. And that's exactly what happened is I came out on the top of the trail after many weeks and it went like, wow, this place was so beautiful. And it changed me so much in ways that I didn't expect that I can't go back to an office. I can't go back and just go. And at that time I was working as a teacher at a call center. So I can't go back to just instructing students being like, you know, here's your, your Rogers bill and how to read the bills and all that. It just wasn't, I don't know. It just didn't jive. So I'm like, well, I need to take this to the next level because I want to continue working in my career in, in outdoor education and outdoor recreation. So I ended up going back to school, uh, you know, becoming a teacher and then specializing in outdoor rec. And that opened up massive stuff for me. So I worked everything from a dog sled musher to rock climbing instructor, canoe instructor, kayaking instructor, you name it. Then one day I was like, you know, I need to stay home more because, you know, over time it's, it's, it's exciting living away from home three months of the year, but you know, life changes, right? Parents age, things like that. Yeah. Um, so I started my own business and I'm like, I'm just going to teach it and go home every night. Yeah. No, uh, I did the call center, uh, we chatted before and we both ended up working for the same call <laughs> That's center, right. just different cities. Uh, I was a uh, technical supervisor, then went into technical training, got into customer service training. And I did that for seven years and it made me uh, very short tempered with people. And it's uh, nobody, nobody calls in to say, Hey, you're doing a great job. Right. And it's, it's draining at the end of the day. And for the agents that uh, do that type of work, the people that do that, uh, hats off to them because they're getting numerous phone calls of problems all day long. And 
uh, it, it wears on you, and it wore on me, and I did very similar. I just had to get get out and uh, away from it all. So I did a complete trade swap as well. Uh, uh, but getting out in nature is calming, and people don't. I don't think uh, a weekend at a, at a provincial campground it relaxes you, but it doesn't give you the connection that most people are seeking or need and with uh, a venture like your Bruce Trail like how long did that take to complete three months something like that yeah yeah so and there's you always have good days bad days uh, on the trail and you, you have goals that people set oh I'm gonna hike 30 kilometers today and you've done 10 <laughs> so, that's right there was a few zero kilometer days too yeah yeah, yeah. there's uh i was talking to a fellow years ago who did the uh, appalachian trail and uh it's one of the things i would like to do and i said what training did you do and he says i put on my rucksack carried everything i needed or thought i would need for two weeks and then said that's it and away he went and he completed it. Uh, I'm not sure how long it took him. I'd have to touch base with him again. And uh, but he said about uh, ten days in is when it, it hit him uh, physically and mentally. Of uh, he says you get better every few every few days, and he says then you have a bad day where everything's sore, and then you. Continue, he says you just have to get up and push yourself. He says if not, you won't accomplish anything. And I'd have to agree with him on that. So, I, I think that's part of the whole concept of the of like, you know, to kind of romanticize it, the spirit quest concept. As you do, yeah. for lack of a better term, um, you have to suffer in order to in order to grow. Um, and I think that those skills transmute for me directly into running a business because I can get up in the morning and I can be like, you know what? I'm not doing nothing today. I can, and I can continue to do that for as long as I choose because it's my own business. I can, you know, hang out with my dogs. I could go, you know, there's a bit of a snowstorm coming down. I could go up for a dog sled. I can go for a hike. I can play, I can go camp. Um, but then there's no gain as well. So unlike a regular job where if you just stop showing up, eventually there's a punishment you get fired and you can't go back when you're self-employed there. You don't have that punishment. The punishment is no money. <laughs> right? yeah, that, so it teaches you. Right. Yeah. And, and, and being on the Bruce was like that where I didn't have to walk every day, but I chose to, and you push through it and you push through the pain and everything else. And, you know, even though I'm a very diehard, no shoes guy, there were anywhere humans were involved was there's suffering, right? There was pebbles yeah. and, long tracks of dirt road it was it was brutal but you know you yeah. worked through it what time of year did you uh do that bruce trail i left june 1st june 1st yeah okay yeah so overall decent weather yes yeah. uh and that that summer i think was the rainiest summer in 20 years so it <laughs> rained nearly every day so yeah. you learn a lot right i never really liked yeah. the rain before um yeah. and even though it, now it's been over a decade i'm like meh it's water falling from the sky keep moving yeah yeah, no, it's, uh, if you're prepared for the elements, and uh, that's part of what you guys do at Barefoot Bushcraft, right? Your, that's right, uh, yeah. Uh, primitive survival skills. So why don't you uh, give us a rundown on uh, the type of skills that you teach there? Sure, absolutely. Um, so for someone like yourself, they may seem very rudimentary, uh, but there's actually, there was a, I, I read an article on it that says it's a, it's, it's a tragedy that instructors face is that you know something and you don't realize no one else knows it. So you yeah. think, you know, oh, knife skills. Oh, it's no problem at all. And then I get students, adult students, slice themselves open. And they're like, well, I didn't know. And you're like, you're right. You didn't know. Um, so that's where sort of our specialty is. So uh, a lot of guys get into this industry and they're like, I'm going to teach the, like, the most hardcore skills of, you know, I'm going to run around with a knife in my mouth and a loincloth and we're going to go out into the woods. And you can do that, but it kind of looks like a pyramid like this, where those guys that are that hardcore, there's like 20 of them in your, in your province or state, 30 yeah. of them maybe, right? And the, But for the most part, the bottom – bigger piece of that is people who know nothing nothing yeah. right they don't know what and they don't know 
Exactly. And as outdoor people, we think, oh, well, everybody should know how to choose a knife, but they don't know how to choose a knife. Very, very citified people. These are all new skills to them. Um, yeah. You know, um, one of the things I learned is that if you, um, you can grow your whole life and never use an ax, barely use a knife outside the kitchen, and you can continue your whole life and never really be outside. You can have a wife and a, or a husband and a family and a, and, and a dog and a, you know, and never leave your city. Yeah. Um, so we sort of were like, wow, I personally think that that's a bit of a challenge. We live in an amazing country that is about 95% empty. Yeah. This country is enormous, right? Um, and unless you've really traveled in Canada, it's hard to comprehend how big Canada is. And for those of you who, who don't know where to have never been, I can travel from where I am on the coast of Lake Erie, 24 hours straight north, and still be on road in my own province, yeah. then have to get into an airplane, a little tiny air, a big airplane, then a littler airplane, then a helicopter, another 20 hours north. So two days, and I'm still, and, and I'm just reaching Baffin Island, which used yeah. to be Ontario and is now none of it. Whereas yeah. if I go to Europe and do that, I've gone through 30 countries. Yeah, exactly. Right? So we need these skills. These skills are important. Um, so the skills that we teach, we start right at the very basics, right? So we choose what's a good knife? what is a good knife for bushcraft and survival use? It is not the enormous, big, huge machete that people like. Um, you'd be surprised how a very simple knife can do all of your jobs, right? And then people are like, oh, well, that's not necessarily true. And you show them how to hold a knife. You show them how to make shavings. Um, and that's a skill that very few people comprehend is how important are shavings to make a fire when you're not using crumpled up newspaper, right? They're yeah. incredibly important. Um, and then we move on from there, how to split wood. If you don't have an ax, you know, I always ask my, my, especially female students, you're hiking through the woods and you see a dude who doesn't dress like me, who has a big ax slung over his shoulder. What are you going to think? And they're going to be like, well, that makes me uncomfortable. They all, all the women say that unless he has like you a beard with the plaid, then they would be like, something's out of place here. And this guy makes me nervous. I said, that's right. But you can do all those jobs with a knife, yeah. right? And few people know those skills. Uh, and then we sort of, graduate from there so now you've learned how to use a knife now you learn how to make your fires um and then you can be like okay so you know your trot your survival pyramid of you know food water shelter um and things like that and just sort of climb up depending on the student skill level yeah. um, and, and i've i'm sorry go ahead no uh no continue uh the, and the one thing i've noticed uh and and uh, even the larger media bodies like CBC and stuff have noticed is that a huge paradigm shift in what people are doing with outdoor skills these days. So it used to be that it was outdoorsy guys that wore the plaid shirts and the buckskin that wanted these skills, bushcrafter guys who wanted to get away from the city and their city life and, and do all that. But now I'm getting more, uh, you know, 20 something year old women and families coming out saying, I need these skills because I'm afraid I'm concerned. You know, they watch the media and there's a constant threat of war. There is a war in the Ukraine, but there's a constant threat of it coming here. We're seeing a massive resurgence in homesteading because basically, for lack of a better term, it's getting too expensive for the average person to live. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. you know, you go to the store. I know in America more than Canada, eggs are apparently insanely expensive in the United States at this time. So what do you do? Well, you can get a chicken that literally poops out eggs every day. <laughs> Yeah. And it's not harder to, it's no difficult to, to taking care of a dog. It's more difficult really to take care of a dog than a chicken. And you yeah. get for literally free eggs. Yeah. Um, have, so there's a big resurgence. We have uh, 18 chickens here. Nice. And uh, we've had as much as 40. And we bred them uh, and bought re re replacements because we also have raccoons and weasels that will clean out a coop in a matter of hours. And, yeah, uh, once the chicken has matured and it starts dropping eggs every day, a bag of feed is, like, $18. That's, like, three packs of eggs. And you're going to get eggs from that chicken for six, seven years, depending on the breed. And at least one a day. So if you have a dozen, well, there's a, there's a free dozen eggs and if you like getting back to your homesteading comment uh heather and i have homesteaded for years and it's just it's 
the way we think. It's we spend a lot of time with our grandparents, and with with that, they always were making their own things. They were canning their food, and it just when uh, we started doing it uh, years ago, it was a gradual. Okay, let's see how much food we can put away. Not as an end of the world scenario, because uh, in today's society, it's everyone is so worried about their career and where they're going with it that if all that goes away, how many paychecks are you from losing everything? And homesteading skills, bushcraft skills, and everything all are essential as far as I'm concerned. And everybody, I, I think the pandemic showed us that. I think that was a yeah. huge worldwide eye opener that you can't yeah. go out, you can't do this, you can't do that. Now, you know, I don't want to talk about the political side of the pandemic, that everybody has their own beliefs on it. Yeah. But the reality was, for whatever reason, you were stuck in your home, right? Yeah. You were, yeah. you, you know, supplies were short. That is not any kind of, you know, political nut job statement. That is the truth. You went yeah, out, it, it, uh, it started with toilet paper. Right. It went out with, you know, started with toilet paper. Uh, again, you even see when there's big, huge, especially where you guys lived like about 20 something years ago, you had the big ice storm that rolled through there. Right. Yeah. And people died. People yeah. died because they didn't have access to basic services. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, and the challenge is today you combat that with the government now saying, I don't know about where you live, but here in Ontario, well, we don't want cities to have wood stoves in them, city houses. Yeah. We don't want city houses to have, um, you know, fireplaces in them for whatever the reason is. Um, the official reason is they can say that they're dangerous, right? Yeah. Even though we've used them for hundreds, if not thousands of years, but whatever. Yeah. Um, but again, so there's uh, a shift. The uh, the wood stove is is a skill, and preparing wood for for heat and cooking is 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 you just you're not going to watch a YouTube video and go do it. <laughs> That's like, true. That's true. <laughs> like, it, it takes uh, it, it's a big learning curve, and we're here in New Brunswick. Like, we've had wood heat my entire life, and I'm 55, and I can remember the wood heat, wood stove going. Uh, there's never a time in my life where we did not have a wood stove, and uh, we currently keep four to six cords of wood on hand. Uh, Heather and I have a 14 acre wood lot and I'm guessing I have six cords down there that I could get if, if I really needed to. But the ice storm, like you said, uh, years ago, in the late nineties, early 2000 ish, we were without power some areas for over a month. And we, we had an ice storm during Christmas, New Year's one year. And I had to cut the turkey in half and cook it on the barbecue. And we had our solar, our small solar set up. So we actually had power. We had a wood stove and we had the, the large barbecue for cooking. So we had, we were, besides not having to go to work because the roads weren't clear or safe to be on, it was almost like a normal day for us. And talking to other people, uh, they would have no idea how to do any of that. So again, uh, it's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you don't know what you don't know. And uh, with the weather systems and the storms and everything, like we're supposed to get 50 plus centimeters starting tonight. And we, just, we just got uh, between 30 and 40 over the last 36 hours from Sunday into Tuesday morning. The forecast called for 15. So with weather <laughs> changing and uh, stores closing and staffing issues and everything, uh, being prepared is it's not a uh, such a far fetched idea anymore. Like ten years ago, even if you said that you were a prepper, like what kind of reaction would you get from most people? Very much fringe. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. you know, running a bushcraft school many many years ago, when I started the school, I would run into you know, older gentlemen or whatever, and we would talk and, you know, I don't know, in a coffee shop or whatever, and they would say, well, how can you make money teaching people how to use a knife? Like, seriously, how do you think you're going to make a living doing that? How do you think you're going to make a living teaching people how to use an axe? 
And what that generation didn't didn't realize is today no one has those skills. Yeah. And it's, you know, and like you were just saying, like you, you just at that time, maybe 40 years ago. So in the 70s and 1970s and before that, you were I believe that's true. You would have yeah. a very challenging time in a urban area saying we're going to show you today how to use a knife and not get cut. We're going to show you how to use an axe. We're going to show you how to whatever. Harder primitive skills like, I don't know, bow drill is something totally different. Um, but just general basic survival skills, um, they were something that you gr learned growing up. I always tell people it would be like today if I had a, uh, a seminar on how to put a T-shirt on and how to operate a zipper. No one would take it because they're common skills. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, those skills have, uh, you know, uh, and you see a push all over now, which is a good thing, I, in my opinion, that the media is like, hey, you need to be, what is it, seven? 72 hour preparedness they yeah. can't get to you yeah oh uh -huh. at least the, that's a starting point as far as i'm concerned 72 hours because there's areas here where it's going to be that as a minimum before anyone can get to you and i'm only 25 kilometers from the capital city and uh well the storm uh sunday night into monday uh, the roads weren't plowed. They did not have the, the plows on the road until just before people started going to work Monday morning. So I have a four-wheel drive, and it's set up to... It's my 72-hour kit. I have food in there. The only thing I don't carry is water in the wintertime because it freezes. But I have a, a stove. I have an axe. I have all the basics. Uh, it's a rolling mobile camp. So if need be, I can take that to wherever but uh i had a question and i lost it oh your uh your dog sleds your team uh how many dogs do you have and what's the longest uh race or event that you've done with them uh, well, you know, they're all getting a little older now, unfortunately. I don't have as many as I used to have. Uh, I just have about four right now, but they're all racers and runners. Um, and we used to go into competitions around Ontario. They were usually between six to 12 kilometers. So like two dog, uh, two dog, either a uh, bike or a sled was six kilometers. Then uh, four dog was uh, four and six dogs was 12. Um, and they, I do it because the dogs love it. Like I, I'm very passionate about obviously anything to do with the outdoors. Um, and uh, the greatest job I ever had was working in a facility in Northern Ontario. We had 500 dogs we had to care for every day. It was me and a team of guys. And, you know, we would go out there and it didn't matter what the weather was. And you're out there scooping poop and, and taking ice out of buckets. Uh, and it, it was like, this is the, I don't, where has this been my whole life? <laughs> um, you know, and I only had one dog then, uh, so then I got two dogs and then I got a bunch of dogs. Um, yeah. And it's just, it's, it's something you have to be passionate about. So the dogs have to be passionate. Not every dog is a runner. I have a Malamute, um, and he's a big lazy dog and he does not have the passion to run. He just would rather sit on the couch all day and that's okay. Uh, he walks, but he won't run. Uh, but the runners, man, you know, you, you, you take that harness and you shake the harness, uh, in my in my house, I have a bank of lockers. So I have each dog has its own lo or her own locker, and I open that locker door out, and they fly all over the house. Yeah. Um, so I have a special bike for when it's. We don't have a lot of snow now in the Niagara area where I where I used to live. I live in um, uh, in a place called Haldeman County now. We haven't got a lot of snow, uh, so it's special bikes that they make specifically for dog racing. So they have very little moving parts. So they have. Uh, brakes and they have wheels and basically that's it they don't have any like pedals um, and special adapters that connect onto the front where the uh, all the rigging goes so they'll and we'll just rip around like I live right beside a big uh, national park so we go out my driveway and right into the park uh, and then when we do have enough uh, water uh, uh, when we do have enough s snow we have a super fast racing sled that's all like lightweight aluminum it's not like you see in the movies where the guys have these sleds that are the size of a car <laughs> you know, um, you know, and they and and they have like fifty dogs. That is like that today in some areas, but not, you know, not in the racing circuit. It's about being light and fast. Yeah. Uh, the uh, primitive skills. Uh, you do a lot of archery as well, right? What's your That's background right, yeah. in archery? Are you self-taught or? Uh, well, originally I. I always had an interest in any of that sort of stuff. 
And um, around 2012, when I started Barefoot Bushcraft, the Hunger Games came out. So, you know, we were a uh, primitive skills school. We taught lots of those courses. And then we kept getting calls all the time. Do you do archery? Do you do archery? Well, I, I guess we do now. <laughs> and a few of the places I have worked gave me some formal training in archery. Uh, the YMCA had a training program that all of their staff had to go through so that they, you know, kids don't shoot each other or, or something like that or themselves, I guess. Um, so then I got involved with the uh, what was called the Ontario Archery Association. That is uh, our governing body here in Ontario. Um, which specifically does archery stuff, but it's the higher end stuff. So um, once you get your, I, I took my Ontario archery coaching certification, level one, two, and three. Um, so that's basically now I am what's technically called an Olympic class archery instructor, although I don't teach that level. Um, so yeah, so you have to basically, in order to teach this stuff, it's always good to go to school and get the good solid background. Um, and even if you say you grew up doing that stuff, you're going to learn something for every course you take. Even as an instructor, I will go and take an archery course. Even though I literally see tens of thousands of students every single year, I'll still take an archery course. Um, I go to big outdoor conventions, uh, uh, big gatherings and stuff like that. I'll go and sit in on a bow drill course because as a, if you're, you know, any higher end instructor knows, they can always learn something new. Always, always. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, so that, that's sort of where my background in archery is, is formal training. Right on. Uh, the, uh, it's, you're never too old to learn and you're never, you're, uh, you can always learn a better way of doing anything and everything, I think. And, uh, there's maybe somebody that you would never expect show you one simple little modification and it makes things easier, safer, faster, or whatever. Uh, so I, I always uh, admire people that are always willing to learn and continue learning. It's it just it's uh, it's like second nature to me. I'm I need brain food, and uh, I know uh, the kids are the same way here. Uh, they are constantly learning new things and. Or asking questions, uh, what about this? Can you do it this way? And if you just say no, no, it's this is all, that's it. Then you, you've blocked the learning process for for two people, right? Yourself and the person you're talking to. Mm -hmm. And I find that as well. My constant thirst for knowledge and consistently going backwards in my in my primitive skills learning is I used to be a, a really passionate um sports shooter i used to do all the competitions and all that stuff and then I, all of a sudden i'm like well what did they use 300 years ago oh something called black powder so i went out I just, you know and I'll clean off. About I, that. yeah i watched <laughs> i watched jeremiah johnson and i'm like okay that's the rifle that i want and oddly enough, me and millions of other shooters saw that movie. Of course, this is back in the 70s when they watched it, when it was yeah. new. And that was a resurgence in black powder, which is funny. Uh, but yeah, so then, and again, there's massive amounts of, of lore, massive amounts of history and everything in between. Um, you know, lots and lots of convoluted old wives tales um, spattered with fact. And it's a great experience. <laughs> it is so yeah. much fun. Yeah. Yeah. Uh in 2012 i got to work in north dakota and on a day we had uh, we were on call and I, I was doing coil tubing down there for the oil industry and uh so we had to stick close to base and there's a few days where we had some time off and could go exploring the area so i went over to uh wyoming and then we hit the devil's tower and then we hit a couple of the forts uh, from the old. Uh, yeah, I was trying to think of the uh, Bridger, uh, the mountain man Bridger uh, from the Revenant and uh, Ed Glass. So I got to tour around the uh, the parkway there, the trailway, uh, Clark, Lewis and Clark. Lewis and Clark Trail, yeah. Yes. So I got to see that and uh, definitely going back to explore that area some more. Uh, the uh, the whole black powder scene and the mountain man scene is uh, kind of the background when I had uh, our shop running, our leather knife work shop. And you've seen some of the, the items that uh, Heather and I mm -hmm. made. 
the fur hats, the moccasins and everything, and uh, the capote. Uh, uh, the only thing I'm missing is the uh, black powder rifle. <laughs> <laughs> it's an experience, my friend. It really is. Now, speaking of, 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 of making moccasins, you know, a lot of people ask, how, how do you get started? And, you know, if you want to start going backwards in time, and I always tell people, the best thing that you can do is make a set of moccasins. And I've, I've read, like, actual archaeological study after study, that there's something that snaps in your brain, and I don't know why it's shoes more than anything else. But when you take the time to make a pair of shoes, it has some weird ancestral connection that gets triggered. And it doesn't matter where you're from, right? Uh, I get asked this question a lot where they're like, are you native? Well, no, I'm not First Nations. And they're like, well, you shouldn't be teaching this stuff. And I say, well, you know, if, you know, my family history is from Poland. In Poland, at some point, someone used a bow and arrow to bring home supper. At some point before that, we used, somebody in my family had to use a bow drill to start a fire. We had to learn how to use all this stuff. Somebody used black powder. Somebody wore a, coon, a, a hat after they killed a coyote. I, I guarantee it, right? If you're from New Zealand, it's the same thing. If you're from Argentina, same thing. Um, but there's some weird connection about making shoes that I don't, I, and I've never figured it out. That as soon as you do that, number one, they will be horrible. They'll be crap, your first pair, but you'll treasure them. And they yeah. they do something, and I'm, I'm sure you can speak a little bit more to it, that it uh, it gives a serious ancestral connection when you make them, and I don't know why. Yeah. Uh, when I made my first pair of tall moccasins, the plains boots, uh, I'd made Heather a pair first, as kind of a test of pattern, and they ended up being hers because I uh, miscalculated the sizing and the amount of uh, seam allowance and whatnot, and they were too small for me. I could have stretched them. But then I think, uh, well, it's, I used a, a deer tan leather, so it's uh, cowhide t tanned like deer hide, like buckskin. So it has the same properties. Uh, it's a little thicker. And it's uh, kind of a cross between buckskin and elk skin, so it's kind of in the, in the middle. Uh, tough as nails to put a needle through if you're trying to uh, do it by hand. The... Uh, and my first three pair were all soft soles. So no crepe soles, no rubber soles. And wearing them through the woods, uh, one, one winter uh, when I was trapping, I uh, couldn't believe how warm, one, how warm they were, the traction I had, and the, the feeling like they were like a second skin, like a... It, the the comfort of them was just amazing and once you put them on you don't want to take them off it's a shame that we've gotten away from that i believe everybody should make their own shoes you know yeah uh recently i come across an article that uh it was uh in regards to a native american asking or telling uh a person to take off their shoes and they would they would heal themselves uh, the you know, it had to do with the synthetic materials that we started using in the late 60s and everything uh, that's basically blocking our connection to the earth and where you uh, are uh, barefoot a lot of the a lot of your days uh, you still have that connection if 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 being barefoot makes you healthy, I'm immortal. I'm like those guys on like like the Highlander series. Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it was interesting, and uh, I I could kind of connect with it, and it's like all right, because I Heather is she uh, she grounds herself all the time barefoot in, the, in the, the minute she's sitting outside the shoes are off and she's grounding and she actually thoroughly enjoys it. Uh, the uh, connection with nature and our food supply and the whole aspect of it, we've been so disconnected from that through synthetic materials, mass produced foods and everything. Uh, the resurgence for people to reconnect and find themselves, uh, I can see that being uh, 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 moving forward, being more more popular in the in the oncoming years. 
Yeah, it comes full circle. Yeah, I, I think it does. And uh, there's a huge resurgence in uh, the uh, paganism and the, the, the old ways, just in general, I think, uh, that I've been reading and listening to different audiobooks and whatnot at, while I work at night. And you can see it happening in communities around you and whatnot. And the getting uh, the whole back to nature when we were growing up it was uh, it was a hippie thing right mm -hmm. yep, yep yeah yeah that's and uh all right so if you could go back to 18 year old you what would you tell yourself mm. um, you know travel more travel more yeah work um, less travel it's, more it's one of the big things you know that's right they always say you know you, you you don't regret the things you did do but you often regret the things you don't and i would yeah. say try get out there and travel a lot more uh if you could live anywhere in the world where would it be and why mm, i've always wanted to live in belize uh just beautiful <laughs> weather lots of water lots of great dive opportunities uh and i could run my bushcraft and survival business year round down there uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah uh yeah belize is uh be quite the spot I suppose one other place would be a place called Pitcairn. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It is the most remote island in the world. Uh, and it's 1,000 miles, so like 2,500 kilometers or whatever, off the coast of New Zealand. And there's like 12 people that live on this island. And uh, they the, the culture there is dying. Yes, yeah, they're descendants of the HMS Bounty. Yes. And they are actually... Yeah, and it's to the point where if you just show up and you're like, I want to stay, you stay there six months and they're like, okay, choose your plot of land and you can stay forever. <laughs> yeah, I, I heard. Yeah, uh, so they'll give you land to stay. Yeah, I heard uh, of they uh, are trying to get a tourism and, and everything going on the island and get uh, residents. So, yeah. That, I, That's right. Yeah. Um, uh, what would a, what would, uh, supplies cost to get there? I wonder. Oh dear. Could you imagine? I had, I had seriously considered it cause I'm like, it would be perfect. It's the kind of lifestyle I lead. And then I did look into it and they were like, well, if you want two by fours, right. A very common building supply and <laughs> pretty much everywhere in the world. Um, they were like, it has to come from New Zealand. So they're like, if you buy one, two by four, you have to have it shipped a thousand miles by water. Yeah. I'm like, oh dear. <laughs> and then they were like, you know, and how will you make the money to buy it? So I looked into the tourism, you know, like very seriously about this. And they make they make four thousand dollars a year in tourism dollars come onto the island. <laughs> the whole island. And that's their main industry. And they yeah. make four grand. And I'm like, they make that in a minute at the casinos in Niagara Falls. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, exactly. Like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I'm still in North America. Yeah, uh, we have a we like we've talked earlier. We have a huge country, and there's still lots to explore in in Canada uh, that's yes. left unexplored, I guess. Uh, so, where can folks find you on the web and social medias? Sure, I am on most social media platforms as Barefoot Bushcraft, the organization that I run. Uh, so, of course, barefootbushcraft.com, uh, Instagram, uh, Flickr. Some of the more obscure social media networks like Vero um, and MeWe as well, Barefoot Bushcraft, and you can find links to our, uh, you know, all of our courses that we offer. Uh, we do a lot of work with children, uh, lots and lots of children, trying to get the new the new people in the world who are, yeah. you know, to try to give them that passion to the outdoors. But uh, yeah, perfect. I'll have everything listed in the show notes at the bottom here, and on the uh, the video portion, it'll be in the description for that. And I thank you for joining us today and look forward to more chatting with you in the future. No problem. Yeah, right. it's great to be here. Thank you. Oh, thanks a lot. And thanks for your time.